when I got sober, I had to Google hobbies. Right. I had to, I had to Google that because I had no other hobbies besides going to work and drinking. Drinking was my hobby. So I think it's very important for people to realize too how much time is actually spent on drinking and to discover what is fun for you now. Um, you can always look back to your childhood. And this is what I tell people that I work with. Look back to your childhood of what brought you joy, because that will bring you joy again when you're an adult and you can connect with that. And that gives you something to do. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of I Love Being Sober. My name is Tim Westbrook, and I'm the CEO of Camelback Recovery here in the always sunny and always sober Scottsdale, Arizona, where my team and I, over the course of many years, have helped thousands of people on their path to recovery. We started this show because there's so much misinformation about addiction treatment, mental illness, and recovery in general. There's so much more to recovery than just going to inpatient treatment, seeing a therapist, and going to 12-step meetings. All of those things are important, and AA saved my life. However, to find long-term recovery and to live happy, joyous, and free, there's just a lot more to it than stopping the drinking, stopping the drugs, stopping the sex addiction, or stopping any addictive behavior for that matter. And to live a new life, a person needs to develop new healthy lifestyle habits. And a person needs to figure out how to have fun while in sobriety, while in recovery. And, and typically this includes new eating habits, new exercise habits, new sleeping habits, new hobbies, new interests. Um, and, and those are some of the things that we're going to talk about today on the show with Courtney. Um, new friends, self-care becomes a priority, boundaries, healthy boundaries. The list goes on and on and on. So those are the types of things that we talk about here on the show. And today I'm here with Courtney Anderson. Courtney is a sober coach, podcast host, founder of National Sober Day and Sober Vibes. So sober Vibes is an online support community for recovery and sober curious women of all ages. And uh, today we're going to talk about Courtney's journey and getting sober at 29 years old, how to have sober sex, um, <laughs> how to have fun in sobriety, and how to avoid relapse. Because um, if you're not sober, if you've never been sober, and if you're in and, and all you know is drinking and drugging, you have no clue what life is going to be like on the other side of it. So, um, Courtney, so good to have you. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. I'm excited to be here today. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I've, I've heard about you and I've seen your show and, um, and I know that your, your community is focused more towards women, mm -hmm. which, um, we're going to talk about your, your community as well. And, yeah. um, and, and sober sex, which, I mean, that's a topic in and of itself because I mean, I I'm sure you and myself and lots of other people out there are like, Oh my gosh, how am I going to have sex? Mm -hmm. Because sex typically, I mean, pretty much hundred percent of the time included drugs and or alcohol. Yeah, especially if that's all you were used to and didn't know how to have sex sober because it goes into intimacy. And that is a hard, hard, hard thing to have when you've never had those boundaries within yourself. Right. Absolutely. You know? Okay. So let's um let's get into it. And so I guess Courtney, tell me about your younger years and kind of when when did you start drinking? When did you start drugging? And 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 what happened? Um, so I started my love affair with alcohol at 19 and I have to say alcohol was always my drug of choice, even though it led me down the road of really loving cocaine at one point of time and then eventually trying crack. But it was alcohol that always led me to the choices I made. And that was my number one love affair with alcohol. So 19 years old, uh, I live out in the suburbs of Detroit. So to go to Canada, to Windsor, the drinking age over in Canada is 19 years old. So we used to go over to Windsor. And I remember that first time we went over there, I was 19. I just fell in love with the atmosphere, the bar scene. I loved the way that alcohol made me feel. Um, prior to that, before I was 19, I I drank a couple times. Um, 
you know, but I, it wasn't something that I loved because alcoholism and mental health issues always, has run in my family. So I always said I would never turn into one of those. So at 19, fell in love with alcohol. It progressed into something dark by the age of 24, 25, um, where I knew I was going to have to get sober one day. And then at 29 years old, I had my a millionth rock bottom, you know, and rock right. bottom looks different and feels different for everybody. For me at this point, I had, you know, already woken up in jail plenty of times and in hospitals plenty of times and men's beds who I had no idea what their first name was, but I could tell you that where I met them, what bar I met them at, mm -hmm. um, you know, just lost opportunities, a car repossession, just all of that. But I was still functioning. <laughs> I know it sounds silly to say, right. Right. And, but people don't understand that. It's like I was still functioning, keeping a job, um, paying some of the bills that I paid, you know, kept a roof over my head. That is functioning when you're able to still do that. Um, but I was just hurting myself and to the people around me. So at 29 years old, I was making a transition from the restaurant business to go into the medical field full time. And it was my last shift. And my boyfriend at the time was like, please don't get messed up tonight. Like, just please. And I was like, yeah, 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 I won't. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. And I won't do shots as soon as I get there. Well, that was all a lie. And I woke up the next morning to my best friend saying to me, she was like, the cat's lost my, my cat, which at this point I had already lost twice due to my drinking. And this is a cat we saved from the streets. She's like, and then Matt's really upset because apparently, you know, I picked a fight with him and stood over our bed and told him I wanted to kill him. And what man or woman wants to be in a relationship with that? So... That happened a couple times in the period of a year and a half with him and I being together. So he comes down the next day, tells me, you can continue drinking, but I'm not sticking around for this. And our cat's missing. So for three days, I sat there, of course, with the worst hang one of the worst hangovers in my life, the guilt, the shame, the cycle that went on with my drinking, you know, and I made a pact to the universe. And I said, if I find this cat, I will give up drinking because I can no longer continue to live this way. I was tired. You just get to a point where you're tired and it's more exhausting living that way than not. So um, I haven't had a drink since August 18th of 2012. And Matt's now my husband and we're expecting our first child in September. And wow. Fiona was found. <laughs> okay, okay. The cat awesome. was found. So that so your rock bottom was that you lost the cat. My last rock bottom was that I lost her. You, yes. Okay, yeah. So would you say that that was your lowest rock bottom? No, that right. was no. It wasn't my lowest rock bottom. I mean, one of my lowest rock bottoms was waking up in a hospital belt, not knowing how I got there, or in, you know, jail in the drunk tank, not knowing how I got there. This was just the rock bottom that I needed somebody because I know people are not really huge on the whole ultimatum thing, but some people need it. And I had not at this point had anybody tell me, yes, I've lost some friendships, but I really cared for this man where it was like, and Fiona, where it's like, okay, enough is enough. And this opportunity was presented to me that had never been presented to me before. Right. And and I can relate to that. I mean, I, I look at my last, uh, you know, shen my last weekend of shenanigans mm -hmm. and I wouldn't say that was my lowest rock bottoms. I had lots or I had lots of bottoms that were much lower. Yes. But right. it's, it, it, and that's the thing about recovery. It's like, you never know, like it, it your rock bottom can be not very big or not very small or not very low. It's like, right. whatever, like when right. you're ready to make the decision and making the decision means that all of your decisions support that decision. That's been my experience anyways. Yes. And from 25 to 29, I tried the whole moderation game. I tried uh -huh. to do that dance. I, tr uh -huh. I tried controlling it. I tr put, tried to put all these boundaries on my drink, my relationship with alcohol and my drinking. And it just led me back to the same spot. So 
finally, when I said, because a lot of people have asked me like, well, how did you just stop drinking? It's like, but we need to back this up. I had four years of trying to make something work that just no longer worked because it had taken over. It, it, t- it took over, you know? Right, 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 right. Okay, so I, I've heard you talk about uh, trauma being the root of of addiction, um, mm-hmm. and, and many people feel that same way. Mm-hmm. So tell me about the trauma that led to your drinking and drug use. Yeah, my trauma was definitely in my childhood with just um, emotional needs not being met, you know, definitely being a product of divorce. And that too was in 1992, 93. So at that point, divorce wasn't like it was today. (laughs) And it's it's silly because it's just like the 90s was not that long ago, you know, but um, it's just so being a product of divorce. Uh, when, when you say divorce wasn't what wasn't divorce like it was like it is today, it wasn't common. Okay, so okay. like I was like the first kid on the street with divorced parents, like mm-hmm. where that shame was uh, was wrapped right. around that. Um, mm-hmm. So emotional needs not being met, um, some neglect going on, you know, and it was just then a series of of events that happened with family trauma, um, you know, and then it just eventually leading into being in middle school and being teased and just then escaping into what then became my, my drinking issue and, and, and how I found peace in that, how I found peace in, in drinking. So I, everybody, I, and I have said this before when it comes to trauma, Everybody has their own, their own form of trauma, and you mm-hmm. cannot play that down because this didn't happen to you. You know what I mean? Like it just it doesn't. It's the same thing with a rock bottom. Just because the extreme low didn't happen to you doesn't mean that it still didn't happen. You know? Right, 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 right. So. Okay, so what did your life look like before you got clean and sober? Uh, I was a I was a pig. <laughs> I was. A little, I, was <laughs> okay. I was. I was so. The evolution too with my drinking, it went in that 10 year span, it was like fun, fun, fun. And then it was not fun. It was drinking every day, doing drugs too. When I was in that three year um, little relationship too with cocaine that I loved. And towards the end though, I have to say, I was not drinking every day. I was a binge drinker where it was like, I then, you know, on a Friday, I would go, I would go for it and I would drink as much as possible. There was no off switch when it came to alcohol. I couldn't just have one or two and be complete with that. It had to be more. So towards the end of my drinking career, it honestly, those last couple of years, it was like maybe once or twice a week of that. But it and, was all- Okay. You had a nickname during your drinking and, and drugging years. Tell me about your nickname. Tell hey, me about you, your nickname. You've done your research. Uh, well, yeah, my friend's called Cornado. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I love it. Yes. Uh, Cor- Cornado. Cor- no. Yeah. When I, when I started to drink, um, and that's the thing, I had friends who wanted to go out with me and whatnot, but then after midnight, they, they didn't want to, They didn't want to deal with the fallout of what I was going to do, but yes, Cornado. So it was Courtney and a um, tornado combined. Yeah. That's such a great nickname. (laughs) Cornado. Don't go out with Cornado tonight. Are you going to turn into Cornado? I I have a, I have a friend. um, His name is Brian and we used to call him blackout Brian. Mm -hmm. And so if he turns into blackout Brian, you're like, okay, no more. We don't want to have anything to do with blackout Brian anymore. Yeah, I had a couple guy friends too who used to call me booze hound, which I found it was funny. You know, I mean, I can look back and laugh at this stuff, and I still my good guy friend still will text me from time to time, and he's like, "How you doing, Cornado?" <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, so now um, having fun in sobriety—that's yes. one of the things we want to talk about today. And you wrote a book guide to think guide a guide. You wrote a guide things you yes. can do while sober. Which yes. I think is important. Someone new in recovery has no clue. It's like you're, I don't know about you, but when I first got clean and sober, it's go to meetings, get a sponsor, work the steps, <laughs> go to therapy. Where you know, it's like, what do you do to have fun? Because drinking is everywhere. Yeah, it's or everywhere. It's, it's and it seems like it's everywhere. And and if that's how you lived your life, like 
I lived, that's how I lived my life. So that was what I attracted Mm -hmm. and that was what I was around. And even the first couple of years, it's like, I'm trying to live how I'm trying to learn how to live life differently. And that includes having fun. So, Mm -hmm. So tell me about this guide. So the ultimate guide to sobriety, it really kind of, it, it, it breaks down that first year with topics. There's 10 topics that I chose in there of, and silver sex being one of them. Um, So you have an understanding of what it's going to be like. So, because that's the whole thing. And, and as much as I love books and reading, sometimes a lot of these uh, memoirs that we read, they don't really tell you what to expect. It's just what they did and went through. So that's kind of where this book came to me. And from my experience at getting, I was a couple weeks shy of turning 30. You know, I was supposed to be in Vegas whooping it up on my 30th birthday. Right, right. Thank you, Jesus. I did not go because I probably would have died. And I've still never been to Vegas. So when I got sober... I had to Google hobbies. Right. I had to I had to Google that because I had no other hobbies besides going to work and drinking. Drinking was my hobby. So I think it's very important for people to realize too how much time is actually spent on drinking and to discover what is fun for you now. Um, you can always look back to your childhood. And this is what I tell people that I work with. Look back to your childhood of what brought you joy, because that will bring you joy again when you're an adult and you can connect with that. And that gives you something to do. So really the book is kind of just, just basing these couple topics down of what you can expect and how, what you can do to, to change it for yourself. Right. So give me some of the, give me a a couple of the things that or well, is there a process in in finding the things that you might enjoy while sober? Going back to your childhood. So for me, when I got sober, one thing that I always enjoyed doing in my childhood when my parents got divorced and I would go over to my dad's house on the weekend because my dad did not have a lot of money. He had to entertain four kids. And so he would buy a box of brownies or cupcakes and I would make that. So but that was fun for me. So right. that's something you have to look on um, to or to I used to play soccer when I was young. And that brought me a lot of joy because when we become adults and then you get addiction in the case, you become a very jaded person <laughs> where mm. you don't think that anything is fun anymore. But that's where you have to tap into your inner child of like, OK, what did I used to do? Did bike rides used to bring me joy when I was a kid? Did coloring like so you that that process, you really have to go there and figure out what you want to do. Even if you cannot think of back to your to your childhood. Google hobbies like I did. And then honestly, pick something that has always kind of made you a little bit curious. Was yoga classes made you curious? Have you always wanted to try that? Um drama classes, whatever the case may be, because there's, there is adult continuing like adult education, or you can find classes at the YMCA, stuff like that. So I just say tap into who you once were pre adulthood and addiction. Right. I I like that. And I, yep. and I just, I, I'm thinking about myself. And when I was young, I was super active. I loved playing sports. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved playing team sports. I loved, um, I just love being outside. I love being active. And, and so when I first got clean and sober, I, I started, I started doing yoga and then I started at, you know, most of my, my activities today are revolve mostly around health and fitness and wellness and recovery. Mm -hmm. And that includes yoga. And I did, I went uh, through a CrossFit stage for a little while, um, spin, um, triathlons. Like I've done a bunch of, a bunch of really cool things. And the thing that I found is that there are communities associated with all of these different hobbies and interests. And to get plugged into those different communities is how you're going to connect with people that are not focused on drinking drinking and drugs. Mm -hmm. And also my experience is if the, the people that are, are focused on trying to stay sober, don't stay sober. Mm-hmm. Like you got to focus on living life differently and having fun. 
Uh, absolutely. 100%. That's why the first 90 days of my sobriety, I didn't have the rehab. I didn't, I tried AA those that first week, something did not connect with me within the within the program. During that time, I did go back year three or four and participated, but it just did not connect with me during that time. So I sat at home after I googled hobbies. And besides the <laughs> besides the baking, then right. I Mod Podge picture frames. And I binge watch Friday Night Lights, which I forever love that show because that's a period of my life that I had to sit there and get uh-huh. really uncomfortable with myself. But it made me focus on something other than alcohol. Yeah. So you had and, and you got to get in touch with your feelings, uh-huh. which we were not. I don't know about you. I would imagine you're the same way. I, I was not in touch with my feelings. I was not aware of my feelings. And any time I felt uncomfortable, that was a time when I reached for the solution uh-huh. and the solution being the drinking or the drugs. Yeah, it, for me, with it was always I was always kind of fine sitting by myself. But what my thing was was self sabotage. Okay, <laughs> like I would go, I would go a couple days, so then I would, I would have my hangover cycle, my drinking mm-hmm. cycle, because it doesn't just start with you having that first drink. It actually starts with the thought process of mm-hmm. like, oh, it's eleven o'clock on a Friday, like a couple more hours, and I can can start drinking. So then the whole cycle, which is very exhausting, <laughs> then yeah. being hung over for a couple days, and then I would participate in life, and then I would start feeling good and level out and feel normal, and I'm like, this doesn't feel normal. Right. So then it was time to party and let me binge drink and be a little piglet for the night, and that's what I was. And then it was, who did I piss off and, and whatnot, and then come back down. So, so Yes. So, I mean, yes, you do have to sit there and get comfortable with just yourself and your own skin. Getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes, especially in today with with how alcohol is everywhere. And that is something I learned those first two years of sobriety. Right. And I'm sure you also learned, I learned this, you know, I thought that everybody that went to the football game got shit-faced. I thought that everybody got shit-faced at the concert, at the festival at the like where at every bar at every club at every get together i thought everybody got shit faced and now today being sober i realized there's really only like like one or two people that are shit faced yeah and, and, uh, and, and right. that was me and that was cornado yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> right exactly and i didn't know that too i think i did not realize that until about 93 to four months in man and I went on a Friday night. We went to this town where we used to live and we sat outside on a bench with coffees. And I was like looking around, watching people just walk around this town. I'm like, huh, this is what people do. (laughs) (laughs) This is, yeah, this is what people do. And there's nobody is shit faced. Like nobody is is shit faced. Man and I had a great conversation. That's the night he told me. I mean, he when he asked me to marry him, he he goes back to that night in that okay. situation where he was like, "I knew I wanted to marry you that night." Like, wow, you know. So, but it is true. Not everybody's d- being animals all the time, right? But like, right. it's it's honestly true because then you have to look around yourself and it's like, as you said in the beginning, who am I attracting? What am I attracting in my life? And so then you're in the circle where you're just and you're in your own thoughts because addiction too is a huge thinking disease. And you just think that that's normal and it's, it's not. Right. So, so let's talk about sober sex. Okay. So you, you had a boyfriend, you were with Matt. How long were you with Matt before you got clean and sober? A year and a half. So you were with him for a year and a half and all of the sex up until you got sober was or was not sober majority yes i would probably say part, like right? yeah like 95% of the time okay and so was it uncomfortable when you first got got sober i mean you already had a a, a significant other you were already together living together having sex and so tell me about the transition from 
the transition was awkward AF. <laughs> because, <laughs> okay. Okay. Be, because this is the thing of what I was doing with sex. I was you I use sex almost as a weapon when the fact of like I use sex to make up with, you know, with him or previous boyfriends after I would have a night of me being an animal and just, you know, MFing a person, threatening lives, throwing chairs. So then I would make that be the center of like, okay, we have sex, everything's okay and normal now. Uh -huh, right. Also, too, you get into a point where going back to the intimacy thing, it is very hard to do that 100% sober when you are not comfortable with yourself. Right. You know, and just like comfortable in your own body and skin. So for the first year there, I mean, there were times where I was like, lights off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would only have sex at nighttime just because I'm just like, nah, it's too much. <laughs> Like, right, right, right. I'm not, I'm not comfortable with this yet, you know. And then plus two, it's sometimes hard going back to going back when I was saying like emotional needs not being met and and not being met with some with some stuff from my parents. And then it's almost like I used from my childhood of those needs not being met that I, I used that when I had sex for the first time and then went on that it was for attention and it was seeking male attention. So it's a hard transition and it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work to do on yourself to be able to come to that point. But right. you also just have to sometimes rip off the bandaid and just do it because the further, and I talked about that in the ultimate guide too. The, the further you keep things off and off and off, the more uncomfortable and like the mm -hmm. more anxiety that you are going to give yourself for not just taking the plunge and doing it. Right. I like that. Rip the bandaid off. And yeah. I think it's, I mean, sex is a way of seeking fulfillment. Yes. And, and, and so that's, it's, it's a bandaid and yes. it's, it's um, temporary fulfillment, temporary pleasure. Um, you get to forget about your feelings. You get to forget about the fight you just had. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're really truly connecting. It's physical when mm -hmm. sex really should be much more than physical. It should also be emotional and mental mm -hmm. and spiritual. Yes. And that's what it's become for me, but also too, in my active addiction, I used, I was very, <laughs> I was a dick to my body. In the way that I allowed people to treat it. So yeah. when you give that so freely, that's you have the story in your head of like, that's all people want from you. Mm -hmm. So again, that's just more work that you have to do in your sobriety and recovery journey. So right. I really had to work on that of being, I'm more than just sex. Right. So, and I think a lot of men and women can relate to that, that especially to getting out of that where, where you just think that that's the only, uh, you feel like that's how your self-worth is validated. Right. So I guess this is a good time to start talking about boundaries. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> boundaries is huge. Okay. And, and how did you learn boundaries? How, boundaries. Did, your boundary, how did your boundaries change? Oh, my boundaries have changed 100, 100%. So because your boundaries change when you start having self-worth, when you start building your self-worth, and I have to give a lot of that credit of my own self-worth and self-esteem issues with personal development. Obviously not drinking, of course, but personal development and really working on rebuilding myself. Because when you get sober and enter in recovery, you are a brand new little baby. Mm -hmm. So you get to build this new life. And I've said it before, like, how lucky are we that we get to live two, two lives in one? Right. It's true, you know? And so when you get sober and, and you're in recovery, you then get to start creating this life that you want. And so personal development has really helped me set and learn boundaries because I never knew boundaries before. When you come from a family who has their own dysfunction, there's no boundaries in that. So... Right saying no. I'm very comfortable with saying no now right, and not right. explaining myself. 
Um, I am very comfortable with not putting myself into uncomfortable situations that I don't want to attend because for the first couple of years, and I don't want anyone to get this twisted, this took me a long time and it has taken its different stages of my recovery where I see boundaries being crossed where I'm like, oh, this has how it's always been, you know, where I didn't see this before in year one because I was just trying not to drink. I think there's, you know, what I think about is I think about the four agreements and I'm in the process of reading that book again for, I don't know how many times. And it's, we were, we were all domesticated, Uh right? We're domesticated by our parents, by the people that were around, by our teachers, by our coaches, by we, we grow up and we're domesticated just like animals are domesticated. And we learn from those people and that's where we learn our boundaries from. Mm -hmm. And so developing or learning new boundaries means to your point, doing the personal development, doing the work, digging deep and learning from some people that have healthy boundaries. Yes. And I read that book every year. That's my number, my first book. Cause I always try to do like 20, 20, I set a goal of how many books I want to read for the year. And that Uh book Every is my first book I read every year because it's so phenomenal. And that those four agreements teach you so much. They do. But But it is true. And, you know, even to setting boundaries is. I don't want to partake in these holiday family traditions that I was partaking in for so many years. This is no longer fun for me. Uh (laughs) And I am a grown ass adult. So why am I going to continue this? Because I always end up leaving uncomfortable. And nobody else is uncomfortable, but I'm uncomfortable. So that's, I had to stop that after a couple of years. And I started creating my own traditions with my husband, Um, you know, and it's just, it's just baby steps you have to do. Also too, therapy has really helped me as well. (laughs) Therapy has helped me a lot with, um, with, with listening and creating new boundaries. Well, that, that speaks to not being able to do this on your own. It's like, yes, I, I see people trying to get people that try to get clean and sober on their own people that try to develop personally on their own. I mean, there you can read books and you can get a lot out of reading books. Yeah. I just feel like there's it's it's necessary to have other people around you to give you feedback. Tim needs to listen to somebody else besides Tim. Oh, yeah. And that's where you know, that's where I've learned. I've done it all. I've I've hired coaches, personal development. I've done workshops. I I partaked in in 12 steps Um, therapy. You know, I have I am a huge, huge advocate for therapy. And you do, because as you say, yes, anybody can stop drinking and try to do it on the own. But what are you really learning on your own? Because there's a lot of a lot of stuff inside where it can still go back to, you know, that type of dry drunk behavior or just because you got sober doesn't mean that the addict has just left you. Right. So let's talk about your fi- family dynamics. You kind of started talking about your family dynamics. So how have you been able to, I guess, break the unhealthy family dynamics that you were used to? I mean, cause you're, uh, yeah, I mean, that one's a hard one because this is the deal. Not everybody is going to, because you kind of become, when you start breaking family dynamics and um, generational traumas and all of that stuff, when you start breaking that, you you get looked at as the weirdo. You're on the outside. Right. So I have just continued to stay in my lane. And if people... And eventually family members either. And this is for friends too, because there you get into some toxic friendships as well. Um, You're the average of the five people that you surround yourself with. Right. So then once you start breaking that, there is a lot of awkwardness, uncomfortableness, but then eventually people will come around and start adapting to your new schedule and to who you now are. So as some, some do, and I have, I have seen that some do. And some don't, and that's okay, because it's just, it is what it is. I mean, with family, 
just because they're blood, I just don't think that you need to buy into that. Like family is everything because there's a lot of people who come from some really shitty families and who would want to keep that around, <laughs> like, you know, Yeah. Be- but that's also t- like that generational thing of like being like burned into you of like families, everything, families, everything. It's like, well, if they're everything, but they're not supporting me in this way, how is that even fair? And then that's where your friends become your family, you know? Right, right. I heard, I've heard you talk about um, attracting the same person over and over and over again, mm-hmm. right? Which mm-hmm. it's, it's like you, you keep, we keep on people in general, we attract the same person, the same yeah. relationship. We're in the same relationship with the same person um, different name. They look a little bit different, but it's, Uh but it's the same person. And then you attracted Matt, which was, which was different than all the other guys. How did that happen? Was that luck or? No, I mean, it was at a point like, and again, you know, you can still start working on yourself, even an active addiction, because that's what I started doing. (laughs) Okay. 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 I just, and it was funny because during that time I was seeing a therapist, I've been in the now therapy for a lot of years and the therapist when she recommends, she's like, do you ever think that you should just quit drinking? I was like, all right, this is over now. (laughs) (laughs) I really liked her. But then when she recommended that, I was like, no, no, I don't have a problem. But um, so during that time, I was working on myself. And I had just gotten out of a relationship that relationship probably was over with about a year. Mm -hmm. And I started working on myself. And he had just come into my life. So it was just one of those things that I do think that when you're not looking, it the person will appear. <laughs> you know, right. the situation will appear for what you need during that time. So, so he came into my life, and um, it was very hard for me because Matt's not a prick. <laughs> like he's right. not. He's not. He did not have any addiction issues. He wasn't. Uh, SOB and he was just a very nice guy. And that's something I had never gone for before. I had always gone for the emotionally unavailable, you know, addict. Right. Because that's what I knew for a very, very, very long time. So um, I think I was just at that point. I, you know, I, I think about my journey and getting clean and sober and it's like the, I didn't date for about a year after I got clean and sober, which Mm -hmm. was what I needed Mm -hmm. and it's what's recommended. And I think part of it is because we react or we attract what we are. I attracted what I was. And so I needed to focus on myself. I needed to focus on my recovery. I needed to learn how to have friends, Mm -hmm. right? I needed to learn how to have intimate relationships with people, with both men and women. And and then I, I look back and it's like the, I, about a year and a half clean and sober. I, I, I dated a, a girl for a couple of years and she was, um, <laughs> let's just say as I got um, farther along, farther down the recovery path, the women that I attracted got healthier and healthier, oh, which yeah. was, which was basically um, a reflection of how I was doing. Yes. And I will have to say that because a lot of people are like, you're really lucky that you had him by your side. And yes, absolutely. But also to him and I had to do work on ourselves. I mean, we've done couples therapy. We've done separate counseling. He had to work on on issues too, because he came from uh, uh, alcoholic family. So there was dynamics there, but what is with any relationship, you have to be able to grow with somebody, you know? So and both parties change. So we, we have come to the table with working on our issues. Right. And healing our own stuff, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's relationships are work and mm-hmm. the, the honeymoon period or the romantic love phase is over after what, 18 months to two years is what they say. And right. so, so lots of things that are going to become issues or not issues for the first 18 to 24 months. Right. And for the first 18 months, you know, year and a half there, we were working with my drinking. That was the main focus. Right. So then when I got sober, then the main 
it's just me getting sober. So also too, that's why it's nice to have a support system outside of your relationship. Because when one person has an issue and the other doesn't, because Matt never had a problem. Matt could, you know, Matt was normal, quote unquote normal. He could have a beer or two. And he did give up drinking with me because he was just at the point of his life where he was like, I'm having two beers and I feel like garbage the next day. Like, and he's very creative. So he was just like, he liked, he likes clarity. So even though he did that, he did not understand how I could sit there on a Friday in a busy restaurant having panic attacks because all I wanted to do was drink. <laughs> he uh-huh. didn't get he didn't get that side. So that's where it is. Um, you need help outside of your relationship because that one person cannot be at all for you. Right, right. Tell me about the sober vibes community. So Silver Vibes community um, is actually something I started when I went back and participated in in AA and I always sat at the woman's table and I was listening to people and I was just like, you know what, there's got to be more to it than just this. Um, When I say that of just at that point, I had started a sober social club and out of that, because I kept hearing women being like, I want to do, I want to be able to go socialize, you know? So I was like, all right. So it kind of blossomed into that and then into Sober Vibes when I took it online. And it's for women who are sober, sober curious, uh, really meeting you at where you are. And it's really an an empowerment support community because that's what we should be doing as women, empowering one another. I stuck with women because I wanted them to feel safe. Um, When it comes to talking about some issues, Uh, You know, obviously a a lot of women have trauma from men and don't feel safe in that situation. And I didn't want it to become some type of uh, predator thing with men and women. Right. Because that that happens a lot into the addiction space. So I just wanted these women to feel safe. And it has, you know, blossomed into the podcast, the Sober Vibes podcast, you know, National Sober Day, and just really being supportive of women in their journey with where they're at. Because relapse is huge. And I do believe it's part of the process for some people's journey and it's about growth and learning. And I don't ever want to shame people for that. So it's just like, let's meet you where you're at and, and be there of support for you because people need support. They don't need you to be telling them what they should and shouldn't be doing. Right. How can people connect with the Sober Vibes community? Uh, it's Facebook. So it's a Facebook group, Sober Vibes, and it's private. So if you come in there, it's, it's just for women only. And I do do the admin on that. So I make sure it's it's women coming into that group. Um, <laughs> you know, I have sober vibes on the my on Instagram. I would say that stuff is public, but more of that support is in that sober vibes Facebook group, and then obviously the podcast too. Okay, okay, awesome. And is there anything else that you would like to share, Courtney? Um, I just I, I've always said this that you know wherever you're struggling that just to know that you're worth it and you're worth the fight because especially in early sobriety, it's, it's a fight, you know, and it's not, it's not something as we talked about before we went live here, uh, people need help in the addiction and recovery space. And not everybody has the same situation where it's all scrunchies and rainbows for them. And it's very, very hard. And that's why addiction is a disease. And it's, it's just, you are worth it. You're worth the fight. So, and, and how can people connect with you? Um, you can either visit my website, CourtneyRecover.com. You email me, SoberVibes at gmail.com or reach out to me on Instagram. I'm very heavy with Instagram. So if you, I, I always respond to messages and talk to people. Okay. Insta- so CourtneyRecovery.com. Oh, no, no. My website, I'm sorry. My website is CourtneyRecovered.com. I also, too, on my website, yes. On my website, I do have a 30-day sober, not boring calendar. Going back to the fun and sobriety, um, you can get it there, and it's 30 days, and there's an activity or thing to do each day to kind of get a feel with you can do this stuff sober. 
but my um, Instagram is Silver Vibes. Awesome. Well, Courtney, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you. I learned a lot. I had fun. And, me too. Me too. And and, and that's it. Bye, everybody. Hope uh, hope y'all have a great day. Bye.